what I'm going to talk about this evening uh, is Queen Victoria's attempts uh, to project um, an image uh, which was supposed to tell people something about the power relations involved perhaps in her family or her political life. Um, Queen Victoria, we all know that Queen Victoria was a very prolific writer um, and each night in her journal she wrote 2,000 words um, and it's estimated that she penned 60 million words in her journal uh, over her entire lifetime. Uh, and she was also a prolific letter writer uh, and her letters, both um, you know, public political letters and private family letters, uh, fill many, many volumes um, and there are many more um, that are not published. So Victoria was certainly hugely aware um, of the importance of communication and writing and narrative, really. Um, but she was also aware, I think, from a very early age, of the importance of projecting an image. Um, uh, we talk about the Elizabethan image, going back to Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, there was also a Victorian image, the importance of images of power. Um, if we look at Victoria at the time of her coronation, she came to the throne in 1837, and she was crowned the next year in 1838. And during that time, uh, she sat for uh, 15 artists. Imagine um, having to give sittings practically every day to these people. Um, and one of the uh, artists uh, who uh, sat, uh, for whom she sat, uh, was the American uh, painter Thomas Sully. Um, and this is the painting uh, that Sully produced uh, of the Queen. Um, and while Sully was um, painting her, uh, they talked. And Sally said that the um, Queen was very interested in the correct, the, 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 the pose that would be most appropriate uh, for these paintings. Um, and also uh, that she was very anxious to dispatch, that was the Queen's word, her image abroad, and particularly in America. Um, and so this is the painting that Sally produced after his discussions with the Queen. Uh, and you can see that um, it's a painting, it's not a formal painting, it's showing the Queen, she's wearing a cr crown and she is wearing robes, it's quite true. But it isn't, the, the Queen is not um, sitting as she would have sat uh, if she was having a conventional uh, coronation portrait with lots of columns around her um, and um, the crown to one side. She's, well, it is to one side there actually, but um, it's a much more um, informal image. And I think that Sally, what Sally is trying to do with this uh, is to um, in show the Queen turning her back on the dark um, and turning her back on the days of um, the bad old days of her wicked uncles, um, uh, William IV and George IV. Um, and um, she's now, you know, she's on the steps of the throne. Um, it's a new dawn. Um, it's a new reign. It's going to be um, innocent and it's going to be young and it's going to be fresh uh, after the... Um, uh, decadent old kings um, who'd ruled Britain for too long. Um, so um, we can see from this, I think, that um, at a very early stage um, of her reign, Queen Victoria has a, a very clear idea um, of what kind of image she wants to protect, how she wants people um, to see her. Um, now, um, quite soon after uh, the coronation, after um, the Sorry, start again. Um, uh, we've got um, Queen Victoria then uh, doing her, um, be, being seen um, uh, with Sally at the coronation. Um, but we've also got here um, a, a painting which was made um, in the following year, which is a very important um, uh, piece of evidence about Queen Victoria's view of what her monarchy was about. Um, Victoria married Prince Albert, her first cousin, um, in... Um, uh, at the year um, 1840. Um, and very shortly after the wedding, Albert and Victoria um, had discussions about um, what they were going to, about getting somebody to paint them. They wanted a painting, big painting, to commemorate their, their marriage. And the painting that they commissioned uh, was this. Um, now, the uh, artist was um, Lancia who was a favourite artist of the Queen. Uh, he was, in fact, her drawing master. Uh, the Queen was actually rather a talented watercolour um, artist. 
Yes, this is one of Queen Victoria's sketches from a little bit later, um, about 10 or 15 years later from, what, from, from the marriage. These are her children um, at Osborne. Uh, and it's a very charming sketch. Um, so um, Lancia had been teaching Queen Victoria. Um, to, he was her drawing master, teaching her to draw, teaching her to paint. Um, and um, this is the, 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 the image that they, that they um, asked him to um, produce. And it was it's rather a surprising picture, I think. It's, it's called Windsor Castle in Modern Times, um, painted between 1841 and 1843. Uh, so you have Victoria in her sort of court dress there, standing um, up in the um, white drawing room at Windsor. Um, and Albert, um, seated next to her, um, is wearing, you'd have thought, very unsuitable clothes to go um, shooting in. Um, he's got very, very fashionable German boots. Um, and um, he's also wearing, you can just see, I think, um, uh, here, the blue garter ribbon. Um, which is the, you know, the smartest decoration, the most important order um, that um, you could get. Uh, Albert is wearing it um, to go out shooting and get dirty and wet. Um, he's also um, obviously come back from a successful expedition um, and brought a, a bag full of dead birds um, uh, there, there, there um, uh, which his daughter here, this is the eldest child of Albert and Victoria, his daughter Vicky um, is sort of playing with and the dogs are trying to eat. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm sure that in real life Albert would not have come in from shooting and dumped all these dead birds uh, at the foot of his wife. Um, <laughs> uh, but this tells us something, um, I think, about... Um, what, what the picture is trying to say. It's trying to say that, that this is, Victoria is in the sort of, the, 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 you know, the, the woman's sphere. Um, the, she is the angel in the house, if you like. She's wearing, she doesn't go out of doors. She's wearing smart court dresses. Um, and this is the, the woman's sphere. Albert has come from the man's world of sport and, and, and killing animals and mud and rain um, into the interior of this, um, of the palace uh, and um, is giving her, as a kind of sort of tribute, um, these um, birds that he's shot. But it is a rather strange image, I think, uh, to have as a sort of wedding picture. Um, now, um, Albert, in fact, it's, 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 you might think that it was um, invention uh, to paint Albert wearing his gar garter ribbon. But in fact, um, it was the fact that he did go out shooting always, or hunting, always wearing his garter ribbon. This is a picture of him shortly before he was, at the time he was married. Um, and you can see he's showing off uh, the garter ribbon um, with its badge and, and, and there. Um, and um, it, was, it was a present to him uh, from the Queen. Uh, and he clearly um, thought it was a very important promotion, as indeed it was. Um, and it is true that when he went outside, he would wear it if he was shooting or hunting. Um, so um, Albert increasingly, was at the, as the, uh, after the first year or two of the marriage, uh, became um, discontented. Queen Victoria... Uh, was determined to hang on to her power as much as she could. Uh, when Albert asked if he could help with the letters that she had to write, and she said yes, she, he could blot them for her. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, he said, well, could he have a task of his own? Uh, and she said, yes, she, he could put on her stockings for her. Um, so Victoria was very resistant to the idea of admitting um, Albert uh, to the, um, you know, to the, to the sort of um, uh, mechanics of her role as um, queen. But Albert, on the other hand, felt that he had been almost sort of, ever since he was a boy, uh, trained to become Victoria's husband and also to take over um, the um, running of um, the um, English monarchy. Uh, Victoria was a woman. She was, in Albert's view, very poorly educated. This wasn't quite fair, but um, she certainly was less educated than Albert, who was a highly intelligent um, and extremely able man. Um, and um, so there's always some kind of um, tension between Albert and Victoria. 
Um, and Albert starts writing letters to his friends, rather complaining letters, saying, I am only the husband and not the master in the house. Um, in other words, he doesn't have as much power as he wants. He's just there as a sort of, uh, you know, as a sort of, uh, uh, almost a sort of ornament. Um, and um, that was not what he expected at all. And Victoria, for her part, is conflicted. On the one hand, she certainly wants to be um, the perfect wife. Uh, and um, she is um, devoted to Albert. Um, she wants to be the angel in the house, as we've seen. Um, but on the other hand, she actually is incredibly bored, she has to admit, by the company of young babies. Um, uh, she really thought they were sort of, you know, she writes letters saying that babies, when, they're being, when you're ba bathing babies, they look like little frogs. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, she felt that, um, uh, that breastfeeding was absolutely revolting um, and something she was determined um, never to do. Um, so uh, Victoria is not comfortable um, as the um, angel in the home. This is not a role that comes to her naturally. And she, is, she, she, is, she always feels this pull uh, to exercise her, her power um, as monarch uh, and doesn't want to give it all over to Albert. On the other hand, increasingly, she's forced to recognise that Albert has a much better understanding um, of um, ruling the country than she does. So this tension <coughs> is um, a, certainly a, a major theme um, in their marriage. Um, and if we look at this painting here, painted in 1846, um, uh, we can see um, some ways in which the um, relationship between uh, the king, the, sorry, creaky floor, um, some ways between the relationship between uh, the prince consort and the queen um, is playing out. Winterhalter, uh, the artist, uh, was an Austrian court painter, uh, and Victorian was in, Victoria was introduced to him uh, by the um, Queen of the Belgians. And he was terrifically popular with all the courts of Europe at this time. So he would come to England, stay only a very few weeks in the summer, to make sketches and return with the completed pictures the following year. So, 1846, this is called the Royal Family uh, uh, in 1846. Um, and um, here you can see we have um, Albert and um, Victoria, uh, both of them seated um, on court chairs, both of them wearing their garter ribbons uh, here and here. Um, Victoria is wearing her court dress, and Albert also is dressed for court with the garter around his um, leg there. Um, and um, it seems um, perhaps that um, a little bit stagey, this painting, this, this sort of velvet um, curtain behind them. Also the fact that these are their children. Now, of course, the children didn't play like that when it was a court. They weren't there at all. Um, but the children here are playing, and they're not making eye contact um, with the um, viewer. They're just playing with each other. Um, so this um, is a court on show. Um, this, is, this, this painting is meant to project a picture um, of the court as being a sort of happy place for the, um, the, 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 the prince and the queen um, and um, their children frolicking around um, on, on the floor. Um, but I think that um, uh, if we look at it a, 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 in another way, um, it is also, if you like, a, um, a diagram of the dynamics uh, of the royal marriage. Because um, Victoria is seated where she certainly should be as the most important person in the family and in the country, head of state. She's seated on the right of Prince Albert there. Um, and um, there are also, um, you can see here that they have their hands, sort of their fingers permanently entwined, um, to, um, which indicates the strength of the marriage. Uh, but on the other hand, um, Victoria just sort of sits looking nowhere in particular, whereas Albert um, is much more sort of upright and strong and vigorous here. Um, and he's, he is looking at his eldest son and heir, Prince of Wales, um, Bertie, who's a major disappointment to Albert because he wasn't like Albert. Um, and um, uh, so it's quite clear that although Victoria is the sort of, you know, she's the ornamental part of the, of the, of the marriage, it is Albert, basically, um, who is in charge. Um, that um, picture is, is a diagram of the sort of 
power structure um, of uh, the royal marriage at this time. Um, let's, moving on. Um, Victoria and Albert, it's true, they did have rows and they quarrelled. Uh, and um, uh, Albert couldn't bear it because Victoria had a very bad temper. Uh, and so she would shout at him uh, and then um, run through the palace, slamming the doors behind her. Uh, and Albert um, would sort of follow rather sort of sheepishly. And then he would write her a little note uh, telling her that she, her behaviour was really unacceptable. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, he wasn't going to engage with it. The doctors had told him that he mustn't engage with it uh, or, or her temper would get even worse. Um, uh, so, um, uh, at the same time, though, we shouldn't see the royal marriage as being entirely um, disastrous. They were very fond of each other uh, and they gave each other presents. So this painting, also by Winterhalter, is a painting of um, a sort of a harem of beautiful women, women um, uh, without many clothes on. And this was a picture that Victoria bought and um, gave as a present uh, to Albert because she thought it, he, it would amuse him. Um, uh, <laughs> um, which no doubt it did. Um, and then um, there is another famous painting um, which Victoria uh, gave Albert and that is this painting um, which is um, a painting um, sometimes known as the secret painting, uh, sometimes known um, as the bedroom painting. Uh, and the reason for those names uh, is that it was a private, intimate painting. It was not a painting um, that was hung in a public place, um, you know, a place where people went in the palace. Um, Albert, Victoria commissioned his painting for Albert's 24th birthday. They were so young, Victoria and Albert, sort of forget. Um, and um, uh, so this is a painting of Victoria um, when she's 24 uh, or so. Um, and um, Albert thought this was his favourite painting of all the paintings he'd seen of Queen Victoria. He loved it the, the most. Um, now, this, people have thought that this was a, you know, an incredibly um, sort of uh, erotic painting. Well, erotic's not quite the right word, but you know what I mean, painting. Um, Victoria has her hair down. She's wearing a sort of nighty um, or a very loose white dress. Um, and um, it's clearly not the, her normal everyday um, image. Um, but um, I think we need to remember something here that um, is not altogether apparent. You'll see that she has her mouth sort of half open, half parted. Uh, and uh, you can see her teeth. Well, Victoria had rather large teeth, and whenever she was painted, they sort of come in the paintings. And um, she's rebuked for, allowing, for not shutting her mouth by her sister, right? Tells her, tells her she really ought to keep her mouth shut while she's being painted. Um, but um, the fact was that um, there has, the reason, you know, up until very recently to this, it had been um, the normal practice uh, that um, royal portraits, always the sitter kept their mouth shut. You didn't smile for a portrait if you were royal. Um, and um, there was a very good sort of pragmatic reason for this, um, which was that um, uh, royal people, like all other people at that time, had very bad teeth, um, black teeth and gaps. Um, so you looked much nicer if you kept your mouth shut. Um, uh, uh, but there was a sort of revolutionary in dentistry that beginning in Paris at the end of the 18th century. Um, dentists began to be able to, um, uh, uh, to ensure that people's teeth remained white. Um, and uh, Victoria, we know by looking at her diary, actually visited her dentist um, before she sat for this painting by Winterhalter. So partly what this painting about is about is about teeth. Um, and she's got her mouth is half paint parted, um, not entirely because of sort of complete adoration of Albert, but partly because she's very proud of her teeth. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, so, so uh, th these sort of presents that go between Albert and Victoria, uh, they also gave each other um, uh, quite a lot of um, um, uh, 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 sculpture, which is at Osborne still today, and which we would think was something that Victorians would, um, would deeply disapprove of and cover in fig leaves. But Albert and Victoria were not like that. Um, they were not prudish. Um, 
so um, here we have um, another painting by Winterhalter, uh, painted in 1859. And by this time, um, it seems that the quarrels in the royal marriage are slightly um, improved and that there has some kind of a arrangement has been um, made that Albert will be allowed to do the office work, do the paperwork, and um, Victoria, uh, with her nine children, um, will try to recover. Um, but here she is. Uh, this is a much more conventional painting than the paintings that we've been looking at before. Here is Victoria um, sitting, wearing um, robes of state, incredibly smart, and robes with sort of fur in them. Um, and this, she's wearing a crown. She's got the imperial state crown with the Maltese cross um, on the table beside her. Um, she's surrounded by these columns, which always, you know, columns, the bottom of columns imply that you're at the beginning of a long and strong life, uh, which Victoria certainly was. And out of the window here, um, you can see um, Big Ben, Westminster Hall. Um, and the significance of that is it implies um, a partnership between the monarch and Parliament. Um, it implies a constitutional monarchy uh, that is um, working properly on both sides. Um, and the Queen is holding a, uh, a, a, some papers, which are presumably political papers relating to Parliament. Um, so this 1859 uh, Winterhalter painting uh, was intended to be um, the sort of official image uh, of the Queen, and it was very much copied um, by people making prints, um, Victorian prints and etchings. Um, uh, it, 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 was, it was frequently um, uh, seen. And you get the impression from um, that um, painting that really everything is you know, in control um, and going well. Um, and the Queen is um, on top um, of her job and everything is all right for the monarchy. Um, but in fact, um, of course, that was not at all true. Um, and um, in 1861, um, Albert died suddenly um, on the 14th of December, 1861, at Windsor um, after a short illness, probably, um, possibly um, typhoid, which is what the doctors at the time thought, um, certainly um, pro more likely um, to have been either, people think nowadays, either Crohn's disease or, or, or possibly some kind of cancer. Um, but anyway, um, Albert died very suddenly and Victoria was absolutely devastated. Um, she is sunk into deepest grief. Um, she, um, her, you know, her, her people in her household uh, worry about wh whether she's whether she's whether she's gone mad or not. Um, she is um, uh, refusing to do her job. Uh, she won't come out for ceremonial occasions like opening Parliament. In the second half of her reign from 1861 to 1901, she only opened Parliament seven times. Um, and this, is, we know, was something that the monarch was supposed to do every year. Um, uh, she um, shuts up Buckingham Palace, um, and um, uh, refuses to spend any time there, more than about a, day, a night or two each, each year. Um, and um, she um, establishes retreats to um, Windsor, which becomes the sort of um, centre for the court. Um, some joker uh, wrote a, um, a, a, a notice, which he posted outside Buckingham Palace, saying, this commanding premises... Um, uh, for um, sale or lease owing to the declining business of the occupant. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, people felt um, that um, they were not getting mon value for money, uh, that the Queen was taking money from the civil list and hoarding it uh, for herself uh, rather than spending it uh, on the ceremonial that was supposed to be her duty. Um, and, um, you know, the Prime Minister um, Gladstone at this time, 1871, uh, becomes um, incredibly um, sort of um, uh, concerned that the monarchy is going to um, somehow not survive. Um, and um, he puts huge pressure on the Queen to appear in public, uh, to um, be seen, um, even for the shortest period of time. Uh, and Victoria absolutely won't. Um, there is even the beginning of a republican movement, 
which for Britain in 1870 was a very um, sort of unexpected development. Um, in fact, the um, crisis of the monarchy after Victoria's retreat from public life in 1861, which culminates in 1871 with the Republican movement, um, this is um, really as bad as the abdication had been, um, or was to be, rather, in 1936. Uh, now, once again, uh, Victoria does attempt uh, to use um, images to um, uh, propose her point of view to her people. So we have um, uh, this um, image here. This is a paint another painting by Lancia, who, if you remember, wrote that painting, uh, sorry, painted that painting, Windsor Castle in Modern Times. Um, this, the title of this painting, uh, is Her Majesty at Osborne, 1866. This is five years after Albert's death. Um, and uh, it is um, meant to convey uh, the um, grief, uh, but also the um, uh, dutifulness of the widow queen. So it's a study in, in mourning. Um, here we've got um, uh, Queen Victoria riding side saddle, um, on her um, black pony with her black, uh, black habit. Um, these are two of her daughters, um, Helena and Beatrice, the two um, youngest daughters, princesses, um, wearing black round their necks, uh, black ribbons on their hats. Um, and there's also a lot of... Uh, oh, oh, yes, and sorry, the, the man holding the horse um, has black socks, black kilt, um, black everything. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis, too, um, on the importance of, of, of obedience. All the, this dog here, um, um, sitting like that, um, extremely obedient. Queen Victoria was a great dog lover. She usually liked having um, collies. Um, uh, so the dogs have to be in the picture. Um, and then um, these, are the, these are her official, um, you know, her documents, her letters that she's been opening. And I don't know if you can see from... Yeah, because this is very small. But the, there's a, they're covered in black edged, um, the, the envelopes, uh, which um, was, uh, you, when you were in mourning in the Victorian period, you had to write letters with black around the edges. And Victoria goes on writing black edged letters for years after Albert died. Um, so there's a, this is, a, this is a, a painting about a, 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 a woman who is incredibly, um, uh, you know, still deeply grieving her dead husband, uh, but also trying to do what she can uh, for her people. Uh, so that um, you find, you know, the letters, um, the um, red box there, um, the um, gloves which she'd thrown on the floor as a sort of, uh, also a uh, part of the iconography of, of power. Um, and so despite herself, um, the picture is supposed to say, the queen is just working away uh, for her subjects. Um, even though she's, um, you know, totally sort of devastated still <coughs> by the death of Prince Albert. Uh, and so we have the stormy sky in the background uh, and um, the beginning of some sunlight, perhaps at the beginning. There were two paintings of, of, of this, one in this dark, stormy background and another with um, a much lighter background. Now, I don't know what you think about this, that as a, as a sort of message to your people, um, you might be a bit surprised if, to, if that happened today, that the royal family did that. Um, but um, it, did, uh, it didn't produce uh, the desired effect. Um, a lot of people uh, were very um, scornful of it. Uh, when the picture was hung in the Royal Academy um, in 1866, um, there was a great deal of criticism. Uh, and the main point that was criticised was not, you know, the painting of the Queen or anything like that. Um, it was the fact uh, that um, the Queen on her pony uh, was being, um, you know, the man who was holding the reins, presumably therefore in control, uh, was this very um, handsome um, Scot, the Queen's Highland servant, um, John Brown. And you can see that he has got lovely legs. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was a very statuesque figure of a man. Can you get statuesque men? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh, there was a great deal of gossip 
And um, news, there were articles in the newspapers uh, saying that um, really um, this was completely inappropriate, uh, that the Queen should be in such close proximity to a servant, um, and that it implied a relationship um, that was um, entirely I improper um, and, um, uh, you know, um, was, was um, something that should be condemned. So it doesn't really work. I, I mean, in a sense, I think the fact that Queen Victoria was... Um, prepared to allow um, um, her, her servant, John Brown, to be painted in that pose. Um, you know, if there'd really been something going on with this relationship, she surely wouldn't have put, put, put out this picture to her people. <laughs> it would have been a secret. Um, but um, uh, she, was, she, was, she was too naive to, to see how it might be interpreted, and she allowed this marvellous study of John Brown um, to dominate the picture, um, with her just, you know, him holding the reins and her just reading the letters on the, on, on the horse. Um, so um, this painting is not, not um, a, a great success in doing what Victoria is trying to do, which was to project an image of power. Um, it, it, it really projects the person whose power emerges from this painting is actually John Brown, uh, not the Queen. Um, however... Uh, for Victoria, there was now a new way of going about things. Um, this painting here, sorry, this, this, this is a photograph here um, by Downey, um, the Royal Photographers. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's a study. Uh, instead of doing a sketch of Queen Victoria um, on her horse, the painting we've just looked at at, at, at um, Osborne in 1866 in the Isle of Wight, um, uh, what we have here... Um, is a painting, uh, sorry, a photograph being used. Uh, and, here, and, and this gives us also a sense, this is John Brown, um, this is one of the princesses, this is one of the dogs from the painting. Um, and we perhaps get a bit of a sense that um, one of the reasons why Victoria was so, um, uh, uh, you know, anxious about appearing in public um, was, might have been that she had actually put on an enormous amount of weight um, something like three stone. Um, and um, as she was only um, four foot eleven, she did look much stouter than she had before. And of course, if you're painting a painting, you can not, make, not, not show that. I mean, the painting is much more <laughs> flattering. <laughs> um, but um, one thing, though, that Victoria realises now um, is that a much better way, of, or a much more sort of immediate way of c c controlling... Um, images of power um, is by um, uh, using photography uh, rather than oil paintings. Oil paintings take an awful long time to get into people's consciousness. They've got to be, you know, they've got to become um, uh, prints um, which are then bought and, and they're still expensive. But photographs are a much better way um, of, um, of, of projecting an image. And in the Victorian period, uh, when photography begins in about the 1860s, uh, there is um, something called a carte visite, which is a, a sort of postcard size image with sort of round corners uh, with a photograph on. Uh, and these um, carte visite uh, were, um, you could buy them at a corner shop. They weren't very expensive. It meant that you had a sort of sense and you knew what the, the, the person looked like, the queen looked like. And um, figures about carte visite show that um, Queen Victoria's images were by far the most popular. Um, followed by her daughter-in-law, Princess Alexandra. So there is a sense in which, you know, it's, there's a, the beginnings of a communication um, in this way. Um, uh, and um, Victoria could, again, control the story. So, for example, uh, this is um, Victoria and Albert, a photograph taken just months, actually, before Albert died in 1861. Uh, and... Um, uh, again, it's trying to sort of use the iconography of a painting with this sort of column here um, and the royal, column, the, royal, the, royal, the royal couple, Victoria looking rather annoyed. Uh, um, I think people, particularly Victoria, looked annoyed in these paintings, in these photographs, partly uh, because they had to stand in the same pose for so long. Um, so, I mean, if we're going to hold a smile uh, for 10 minutes, it's, it's, it's going to end up as a sort of grimace. Um, and, um, so, and Victoria particularly uh, didn't like being photographed. 
as you can tell from that photograph, perhaps. Um, uh, but this is now the sort of thing that Victoria is able to do uh, with photographs. This is a, a, a wedding photograph. And the people who are getting married are here, uh, Princess Alexandra uh, and, um, of Denmark and um, Bertie, Prince of Wales, Victoria's uh, eldest and um, disgraceful, as she thought, uh, son. So they're getting married. Uh, and this is 1863. Uh, Victoria has been a, a widow for two years, but she still thinks it's far too early um, to be happy. Uh, so the, all the wedding photographs are taken in front of, with the grieving widow, Victoria, in the middle, um, paying absolutely no attention to the married couple, uh, but sort of in, in a sort of, you know, um, a, a sort of um, uh, completely um, adoring uh, uh, sort of, you know, connection uh, with this bust of Prince Albert. That's Prince Albert there. And so the idea is that by far the most important per person and, and the person who we should really care about here is the Queen. And the Queen um, cares about Albert, who dominates the painting. And these are the photograph. And these two, uh, uh, Alexandra and Bertie, uh, really don't matter at all. They're not, <laughs> even though it's their wedding. So Victoria allows her grief um, to become a tool, which means that she basically st steals the show um, and, uh, for her, from her children. Um, uh, so that um, photography, then, is important. Now, the other thing that is happening at this time from in the second half of Victoria's reign, after 1861, um, is that the power, the political power, of the monarchy is declining. Um, and this is... Um, largely because of things which are totally um, outside Victoria's control. Um, basically, the growth of the electorate, uh, the two re the Reform Acts of 1867 and 1884, um, which mean that um, many, many more people um, are given the vote, um, and that um, uh, governments are now appointed, elected by the by the, 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 the people, um, and perhaps you could say they're also appointed by Parliament, but they certainly are not appointed by the monarch. Um, at the beginning of her reign, Victoria had thought she could influence the appointments of governments um, when she tried to keep out Robert Peel um, in the bedchamber crisis. Um, but um, by um, the sort of second half of the reign, it's quite clear that the monarch is just uh, you know, a formal formality uh, without real political pull. Um, but what is interesting is that um, Victoria develops new spheres of influence, new types of power. Um, and um, uh, one of these is uh, the um, empire, and particularly India. <coughs> Victoria had a very strong affinity uh, for India. She, was, she, she loved Indian people. Um, and she, 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 in exchange, was much um, loved by the Indians. Now, partly, I regret to say, uh, Victoria's um, uh, love for India was, um, uh, you might call it plunder. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows what Victoria is wearing here. Uh, she's, she's, she's wearing such a, a, such a magnificent diamond that she doesn't need to wear hardly any other um, jewellery. You know, this is the, the Koh-i-Noor. And this is a painting um, by Winter Halter, again, doing his duty. Um, a painting um, of the Koh-i-Noor made in 1856, um, just after the Indian Mutiny, actually. Um, and um, here is the, 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 the Queen, um, uh, you know, defiantly, um, wearing this amazing um, jewel. Uh, Victoria, on the whole, was not particularly greedy about um, plunder from her colonies, but the koh was an exception. Um, v Victoria really wanted um, the koh to be presented to her. It was um, uh, taken from the... Um, from, 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 from at the, the Punjab at the time of the Sikh Wars in 1850, um, and it was presented to Victoria, who allowed it to appear at the Great Exhibition in 1851, but otherwise um, it remained um, in um, Victoria's um, crown jewels. Um, and it is a, 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 Victoria here is the sort of, you know, the flagship um, for the, 
the, at that time, uh, the biggest diamond in the world. Um, but I think that um, th there was a, a much more sort of, um, uh, sort of well, extraordinary relationship really going on between um, uh, Victoria and her Indian empire. Um, the, Victoria was ev never went to India, and, and I don't think we can criticise her there for that. Uh, it would have been unthinkable at that time, really, for a, a, a female monarch, I think, to go to India. Um, but um, though she never went there, uh, she was, in a sense, everywhere, all over India. Um, the Indians were made to be, by the British, extremely conscious of Victoria. Uh, so, um, you know, she was on the stamps, she was on the coins, and India was covered, covered in, um, uh, in, 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 in statues of Queen Victoria. So she was very much a sort of presence to the Indians, even though um, uh, she um, uh, didn't really... Had, didn't really know what India was really like. Um, and she um, was known as the mother um, of the Indians. It's this very sort of emotional um, relationship between um, the Indian people and um, the absent um, queen. And India also uh, gave um, Victoria the opportunity uh, to give herself a sort of, you know, a, a pay rise um, and um, make herself an empress um, because um, in 1876, uh, Victoria persuaded uh, her prime minister, Disraeli, of whom she was very fond, um, because he did what she said, uh, uh, and, uh, she persuaded Disraeli uh, to agree to her proposal that she should be made empress of India um, uh, rather than just queen. Uh, and of course, you know, there were some reasons quite close to home why she wanted to do that. Her daughter, Vicky, who we saw as a small child right at the beginning, Vicky um, had, was married to the heir to the um, German throne, the heir to the German empire. So it would really not do if, if Vicky was, became an empress and was allowed to go through doors in front of her mother. That would be completely unacceptable. Victoria had to be an empress too. Uh, and so uh, Victoria, um, from now on, signs herself um, Victoria... R et I, Victoria um, Regina et Imperatrix. Um, and it meant, I think, an awful lot to her. Um, now, Victoria did have um, uh, some Indian servants. Uh, in fact, Victoria's most sort of difficult and controversial and unpopular relationships are the relationships that she had with her servants. Um, either with John Brown, who we saw a little bit ago, um, or um, now um, with um, this um, gentleman here, um, Abdul Karim, known to others as the Munchi. Um, Abdul Karim uh, was the Queen's um, Indian secretary, um, Indian servant. He taught her how to cook curries. She became very fond of, very partial to curry. Uh, uh, and he also taught her how to speak and write Urdu, uh, so that she could communicate and understand the language of her Indian people. Um, he was treated very badly by the royal household, who thought that he was a, a sort of imposter and pretended that he was much grander than he was in India, uh, and also um, uh, 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 disliked the fact that they, were refu they couldn't get access to the queen because the Munchi was her favourite. Um, but here, what's happening is that Abdul Karim is sort of getting his own back. Um, this is a photograph that was commissioned by um, Abdul Karim um, at the time of the um, Diamond Jubilee in 1897. Um, and he set this photograph up, uh, and, it, and then it was, it was in a couple of newspapers. And then when the, when it, when it, when the royal household realised what, what had happened, that this, this photograph had been published, um, it is pulled, and there's a major row about it. Um, why? Well, the reason is that this, this, this photograph is basically um, Abdul Karim rather cleverly uh, getting his own back, um, because this is, it subverts the way photographs of the Queen should be entirely. The person in control um, dominating the situation is Abdul Karim. Uh, the Queen is, um, is in the pose of a little old lady doing what she's 
told by this towering figure here. <laughs> Uh, and, um, you know, writing letters, whatever, according to his uh, instruction. So, um, because the painting, so, uh, sorry, the photograph, so completely um, reversed what was supposed to be the relationship between the queen and her servant, when in fact it's really the queen who's the servant almost, and the, he who's t the boss, um, there is a major um, outcry. Um, <coughs> but I think we should say congratulations to Abdul Karim to think of such a witty joke. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, India then, for Victoria, is a major source of influence and power and um, prestige. And even though she never went there, um, it, it, and it, it, there is a genuine, rather strange, um, virtual relationship, if you like, between um, the Queen and her Indian subjects. And the other um, sphere, new sphere of influence that Queen Victoria develops in the last two decades of her reign um, is um, the, um, uh, the family. Um, and uh, the, the family um, now uh, has become, um, uh, you know, um, sorry, I can't look at this watch. Um, has, has become much greater. Victoria had 42 grandchildren, uh, and she was known as the grandmother of Europe. And here she is um, uh, at, in, in a, um, 18... 1887 Golden Jubilee painting um, by Tuxen, Danish artist, um, and um, Victoria is in the front. Uh, you might think playing with her grandchildren in a very charming family picture, and that's what Victoria said it was. It was a charming family <coughs> painting, but it's actually also a painting about power uh, because the Queen. Um, she may be small and she may be, you know, she, playing with the babies, but she is the woman who calls the shots within this enormous extended family. She is the person who keeps it together with her enormous correspondence to all her family um, painted here. She is the person who arranges the marriages. She is the person whose best um, entertainment was when one of her granddaughters were going into labour, um, Victoria would listen and come to the bedroom and watch it for hours on end. Can you imagine having Victoria watching you while you're in labour? Um, <laughs> uh, but she keeps, the, she keeps this whole dynastic uh, situation, um, uh, you know, she keeps it going. Um, and it is her power base. She is enormously um, powerful as a result um, of um, that. Um, so um, we have these two new types of power that Victoria um, develops. Um, and um, we also have the sort of very simple narrative that she creates of herself um, as a widow. Um, from the time of Albert's death until her own death, she always wore mourning clothes, black, black, black. Um, and uh, she uh, posed as, um, you know, this is a carte visite of Victoria. She posed um, as a sad black widow dressed um, old lady here, here, um, and here, um, mourning, always in black, um, always, being, yeah, always, always being made to look rather thinner than she actually was. Um, but I think there develops a sort of um, a narrative uh, of Victoria as the sort of grandmother of her children and the grandmother of the nation, um, the widow of Windsor, the woman who's had such a tragic life, uh, but nevertheless um, continues um, to have a, a, a deep um, concern for the welfare of all her people. And so um, at the end of her life, this time, uh, Victoria is really far more popular than she had ever been before. Um, so um, with her skillful handling of images, as she does with this, um, I think Victoria is able to um, uh, create um, a, 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 a sort of a narrative about her which enables her um, to be um, an incredibly powerful and um, popular monarch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, nowadays, uh, royals and celebrities have, um, have their own um, image consultants to, uh, <laughs> to, to get advice on what sorts of image to, to project into the, the public sphere. Um, back then, uh, I, I would imagine there would be courtiers, or would, they, would someone else step into that sort of role? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think it was Victoria herself, uh, well, on her image. 
especially the black. I mean, her family endlessly was saying, oh, for goodness sake, you know, lighten up. Uh, uh, she was, uh, she was at, at a wedding or something. She insisted on wearing the black. Um, and I think she, from the point of view of the, you know, the narrative and the sort of character that was being portrayed, perhaps that was sensible. But I, I don't know of anybody who's advising her to do that. Um, Albert would have, but I mean, he wasn't around. <laughs> Victoria spent a lot of time lambasting Paul Bertie for not being like his father. Did he do anything to influence how she was seen after she died? Uh, you mean, um, well, I think he, you mean to, to, to uh, that, yes, you mean to sort of affect her, her image. Uh, well, um, I think he did do a bit. Um, I think that he and his um, siblings were all a bit worried about how she was going to come across for the last years of her reign. When, I mean, you know, the last 40 years of her reign when she really hadn't appeared hardly at all. Uh, so they started saying that this was a sort of holy period of Victoria's life and nobody should really write about it. Um, Bertie also um, uh, uh, was quite um, clear that there shouldn't be a biography of Victoria uh, and that she should be commemorated just by um, publishing letters. And the letters that were published were redacted to take out anything about the womanly side of her life. So anything about children or babies or any jokes, they all went out and they just show a picture of Victoria as being extremely sort of uh, fascinated by politics and... and <laughs> Uh, so, um, but, but I think, you know, when Victoria died, she was incredibly popular, uh, and everybody wore black, the shops were all, you know, had black in their windows, it was, it, pe people felt that, people were crying in the streets, they felt they'd lost their mother, um, and so I suppose um, that that was not something that Bertie was going to go against, um, that was something that he was, he was going to, 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 to support. And of course, there is the story of Bertie having this last minute reconciliation with Victoria on her deathbed. Uh, when she cried out, she couldn't see, she was blind, but she cried out for, for Bertie and, um, and, and, and gave her sort of, um, uh, 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 and gave him a hug. <laughs> so it's complex, his relationship. It seems that she was uh, conscious of the power of the image from a very young age, but what's the origin of that? Was that something that came from her as an individual or was she a product of her time? Was she influenced by the fact she was a woman or what? what? Uh, how, I, how was she aware of it from such a young age? Uh, I, well, no, I think that uh, is an excellent question. I don't really know the answer. I mean, uh, when I was preparing for this talk, um, um, I, I, I found that conversation between her and Sally, which showed, showed that she was obviously very alert to her, anything about her, her, her image. Um, I don't know whether her mother, the Duchess of Kent, encouraged her to, um, you know, encourage the idea of an image, uh, you know, all those tours that they went round. Um, her mother dragged her around, but Victoria hated doing that um, and stayed with people and visiting parts, you know, royal progresses all over the country. I don't think so. I think it was something that was Victoria had worked out for herself so far as that, but it may, that may be wrong. But that's what it seemed to me looking at what was going on. And it's also true that very little has been written about this by historians, so there isn't a great literature on Victoria and her image. That, sh that should be corrected, really. The period after Albert, after, uh, Albert died was um, when she re withdrew into herself. Is there a case for thinking that that might have been a clinical depression? And if so, I haven't seen very much written about it. Um, yes. Uh, I think there are some people who thought that she was trying it on at the time. Um, but I think um, that there is a school of thought amongst modern commentators uh, that um, uh, Victoria's grief was rather like the, the grief sometimes of um, uh, mothers whose children had been killed in the First World War. It was sort of extreme grief, and it had, had become a sort of a, 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 it was a, you know it was a it was it had become a sort of psychological issue. It wasn't it wasn't just part of the natural grieving process. It, but she got sort of stuck in the grieving process. Um, so um, I think that, um, I agree, I think there should be more work um, done about that because uh, there's an awful lot of material on Victoria's symptoms, a lot of people writing about her around her and she herself was writing a lot how she felt and, and uh, you know, pathetic things like you look at the watercolours that she did when she was after Albert's death and they're completely gloomy and no people in them at all and it's usually dark. I mean, I think she was depressed, definitely. Um, did Victoria have any real influence over her grandchildren, which included the German Kaiser and the Russian Tsarina? 
Sorry, influence over her grandchildren. Yeah, which included the German Kaiser and the Russian Tsarina. The, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Kaiser of... Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, she had the Kaiser and the Russian Empress, uh, you mean, those two. Uh, um, yes, Aliki. Aliki. Well, I think she, uh, she was absolutely furious when her granddaughter, um, Alexandra, or Aliki, as she was known, of Hesse, uh, married um, the um, Tsarevich, who became, you know, became Nicholas, Nicholas II um, of Russia. She thought Russia was an absolutely appalling country. Uh, and... <laughs> And, and dangerous, and never should, should anyone go there. And, and I suppose, actually, she was proved right <laughs> uh, from, from Aliki's point of view, who died a dreadful death. Um, uh, and from the, uh, the Kaiser, uh, her grandson, uh, she uh, actually got on rather well with him. Uh, and he, she, the, the Queen Victoria was the only English person who the Kaiser would take seriously at all, only member of the English royal family. So um, because Victoria was able to sort of tell things to the Kaiser, which if other people had told them would have caused a sort of international incident, you know, would have, um, uh, uh, he, he, she was used by the foreign, well, not foreign secretary, but ki uh, prime minister and foreign secretary, Lord Salisbury, uh, as a kind of sort of uh, messenger between the English government and the German government. Um, and her influence with the Kaiser actually was quite important. She could calm him down. And of course, when she died, after she died in 1901, um, Bertie, her successor, couldn't calm the Kaiser down at all. And whenever they met, there was a scene and difficulty. And uh, you could argue that this was one of the sort of causes of the First World War, not, not high up on the cause list, but it certainly was a cause. Victoria's narrative of herself rub off on other sort of eminent Victorians. Does, does, a, does a sense of Victoria's self become part of what becomes the Victorian era? Um, yes. You mean sort of black and gloomy? <laughs> black clothed. Um, uh, uh, yes, I think there is. And I think, uh, I think a lot of widows probably did um, follow. I don't know how much they did. She was followed, but I think she would have been um, a bit. In, I mean, I think, you know, Victoria's famous for saying when somebody made a joke, we are not amused. Um, and uh, she always looked very grumpy. But actually, when she was in her 60s and 70s and 80s, um, she was actually rather, um, it was, it, she was far better and far easier to get on with. And um, laughed a lot, made funny jokes, told funny stories. Um, and the pu it was only the public image that she got on the sort of, you know, that the, all the black, got on all her blacks and looked like a frump. Uh, and furious with everybody. Uh, this, this, this was not her, the, the, the the Queen Victoria that her ladies-in-waiting talk about um, was this rather sort of witty character who they all loved because she was so sort of friendly and funny. So... <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I think we've reached 7 o'clock and I'd like to thank Professor Jane Ridley very, very much. It's been a fascinating <laughs> Thank you.